with its Simons of the Tree Council of Ireland. And uh, I suppose, given the time of year that National Tree Week occurs, it's not so easy to identify trees because there's very few, if any, leaves on most of the trees and so on. So Ian is going to talk you through how to identify trees and various other tidbits about trees in springtime. And uh, there was a bit of error there in the setup where she had a big horse chestnut in autumn time uh, and in the bump advertising this to see if any of you spotted it. But um, anyway, when Ian is finished, you should all be have no excuse whatsoever for not being able to recognise trees in springtime. So I'll hand straight away to Aina Launa, our current president of the Tree Council of Ireland. Aina. Thank you very much, Brendan. Good morning, everybody. It's great to welcome you to our first of our seminars for or our webinars, we must call it, for National Tree Week, which is running all of this week. And as Brendan said, it's springtime and we're all out walking. We're walking our 5K. And as a consequence, we, we like to look at what's around us, but quite often uh, people get more pleasure out of stuff when they actually know what it is actually called. So now I'm going to share my screen and hopefully that will work. And I'm going to start my video from the beginning, if this I can do as well. From the beginning, it says. So here's from the beginning. And there we go. Now, you should have a full screen with my name and it says in and Ilona, trees in spring. Is that fair? I presume, Brendan, you can see that and then everybody else can too. Great. Now, what you're looking at there is a birch woodland in springtime. So you've got birch trees and as you can see the leaves on the birch tree are few and far between. Now this is later in the year than March, we're probably looking at late April, but the point is that the light comes through, the leaves are not on the trees and we have this wonderful um, carpet of bluebells underneath. So that's why I'm having that for my opening slide. So that picture I'm showing you here is a picture of the late great Eamon the Butler. Now Eamon the Butler was the man. He was Ireland's David Attenborough. He was Europe's David Attenborough, I suppose, really, in a way. Eamon the Butler spent his whole life filming and making things about nature in Ireland. And he was a great lover of this. And he lived to a very ripe old age in his late 80s. He's not that long dead in actual fact. And he always said that, People that are out of doors have a great sense of well-being. Your mental health will never suffer if you're out of doors. And I think this is really, really um, relevant at this time when there's so much, uh, you know, people being confined to five kilometres and everything else. It's really important to get out and about in your 5K and where there to be woodlands or trees in your 5K, you know, you're away in a hack altogether because this is an, an even more and more wonderful environment to be in. Now, you can't say you didn't see it here because I'm starting at the very beginning and really the trees that we have in Ireland go back 10,000 years to the end of the last ice age, which is a daisy in the bull's mouth, which is nothing compared to say if I was in the tropical rainforest, those places would have trees continuously for three or four million years. We only have 10,000 years worth of trees. And this is a picture of Ireland during the Ice Age. The ice, as you can see, is right up to the tops of the mountains and just the tips of the mountains are sticking out. OK, OK, it's not the Ice Age because we didn't have cameras then. It's, it's a cloud bank, but it gives the same impression that the ice is covering all of the ground. And there were little bits sticking up like that above the ice because the ice didn't cover the very tops. The top sticking out of a great name. We used to learn it in school. We thought it was a great name anyway. It was called a nun attack. And of course, as we were taught by nuns, we thought to be learning about nun attacks were wonderful things. But anyway, nun attack is a, is a, green, a Greenland word. So we had this ice covering the whole country. And then from 12,000 years ago, it began to melt. And as it melted, then, of course, you can imagine all that ice had to go somewhere. It went into the sea. The seas were about 50 metres deeper than they are now. And Ireland, sorry, the seas were 50, 50 metres more shallow than they are now. So as a result, Ireland was joined to Britain, Britain was joined to mainland Europe, it was all the one. And as a consequence, the, 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 the trees and the plants and the animals that were, I don't know, getting suntans below at the Mediterranean, were able to spread north 
over the land all the way to Ireland. So you had birds coming, you had wind blowing seeds, you had birds landing on the branches of trees that had wind blown seeds, things like birch, for example. And then they would have eaten berries perhaps as further south and they do droppings, the berries and the droppings would, would take root and you got lots of trees in Ireland that have berries on them as fruit. And then finally, the trees that are um, cultivated by acorns, by nuts, they had to be carried by mammals. And that, the, the mammals took longer to come. So we have so many of those ones to be native. We have acorns on oak trees. We have hazelnuts, perhaps. But we many of the other ones that have come have nuts, like, say, beech or walnut, for example, they, they didn't come with the animals because the animals didn't get here in time because we only had a thousand years of being joined on to Britain and joined on to mainland Europe. Then the seas rose so high that Ireland became an island. So we're an island now. We were an island for the last nine and a half thousand years and the soils began to form and the trees began to grow because there were no people here. So we got different types of woodlands. You can see here in the front of this picture here, we have um, oak woodland. There's no, there's no leaves on those trees. And further back, we have um, pine trees and um, Scots pine were native to Ireland at that time and grew up on the mountain regions. And in fact, where we have um, better soils, then we'd have forests like these with birch, or we could have had forests with ash, elm, these kind of things. And the different soils determined which was the canopy tree. So this is what happened. And when we look at the trees that came like this, we, 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 there's about 28 species that came like this, being brought by the wind or being brought slowly, slowly, slowly. So as a consequence of coming in this way, they, they brought their baggage with them, if you like. So the creepy crawlies that were on the leaves, the things that ate the lichens, the plants that grew on them, all of the associated baggage came with them. So this is what we mean when we say these kind of trees are really, really good for biodiversity because they always came with biodiversity attached. Later on, of course, then we got lots of other trees as people came to Ireland, people brought trees with them from where they lived, planted what they knew in other countries. And Ireland is a great country for growing trees. We have plenty of rainfall that trees need. We don't have freezing cold winters like minus 20, like they have in Arctic Canada. We don't have droughts. If we have four days without rain, we're saying where's the rain and things like this. So as a consequence, it's a great country for growing trees. So we've lots and lots and lots of different species of trees. But for example, if you take a seedling, or just a seed of, say, a eucalyptus from Australia or uh, something like a, um, a monkey puzzle from Chile, you just bring it with you. You don't bring all of the associated creepy crawlies that are feeding on those trees with you to Ireland as well. So while the tree will grow, the things that were depending on it in its own country of origin aren't here as well. So not that there's anything wrong with those kind of trees, but when people say the native ones are the best for biodiversity, that's all they're referring to. That's all. There's nothing wrong with them otherwise indeed. So there's different areas. This is actually um, a piece of the burren and you can see there's woodlands over there as well. The soil there is, is um, calcareous, it's, a, it's lovely alkaline soil and you've got trees growing up along the back, much, much hazel woodland along here. So these were the kind of woodlands that were here before people came. So here's a map now of the woodlands that are left, because as you can imagine, 10,000 years ago when there were no people here, all of the places that could grow trees grew them. So we didn't have trees growing on the tops of the mountains or by the seashore or where all the lakes and the rivers and the, the, the bogs were, but they were everywhere else something maybe 75-80% of the country covered in trees. Whereas now you can see these green areas and these are the areas where we have trees now. So some counties have lots of trees in them. I'm looking at Clare, looking at South Galway. I'm looking over here at Wicklow, looking up here at um, Cavan. And here's Leitrim. And here's a bit of, um, what county is that? That's Roscommon, isn't it? And up here is East Donegal as well. And some counties... <laughs> there are very few trees in them. I'm looking at Dublin, not exactly bursting with trees. I'm looking at Meath. There's not so many forests in Meath either, indeed. So because other things are happening there, people are living there, people are growing crops. There, there's there's um, lots of areas covered with grass for animals. And this is what has happened to our forests. They have been removed because as people came and wanted to have farmland, 
They needed to grow grass for their animals. They needed to have soil to grow their crops. And it wasn't just in Ireland that this happened. This happened all over, all over Europe, everywhere people go. They need space for farming. And farming was only invented 10,000 years ago as well, interestingly enough. So um, this is this is the, the, the spread of farming and people carrying out farming activities meant that they weren't hunter gatherers any longer. They removed the trees and they grew things. Now, let's look at these famous 28 species of native tree that I was talking about, the ones that came of their own bat with, with other animals bringing them, not with people. And there's a whole list, and I know lists are invidious and we can't be looking at lists. But you can see that some of them, we've more than one. We have two different oak species, two different birch species, two different species of cherry, which does not include the Japanese cherry blossom at all. That's a Japanese tree. We have two two other cherries, the wild cherry and the bird cherry, which are native ones, four species of willow. And then we have ones with the fruit on them like apple, rowan with berries, hazel with nuts, white beam has little berries on it as well. Holly has berries, blackcorn has berries, hawthorn has berries, arbutus has berries, elder, spindle, gelder rose, they all have berries on them. So I'm saying about the, the, the birds who 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 ate the, ate the berries and then pooed out when they got here were obviously in business because look at all the, these trees with berries that managed to get planted. Hazel has nuts on it uh, so that's had to be carried along by mammals maybe and of course oak has nuts on it, the, the acorns are nuts, they would have to be brought as well. And then we're looking at wind ones, so the, the seeds of the alder, for example, are blown by the wind, similarly with the Scots pine, it, it, and, the, you know, and the ash, for example, these are wind-blown seeds, the yew is back to having berries again, we'll come to that again. So you can see by looking at what our native species are, you can understand how they got here without people having to carry them at all. But as I said, lots of other species of trees will grow here very well too. And we have them in two groups, if you like. We have deciduous trees, which means that they lose their leaves in the autumn time and get them back again in spring. And then we have evergreen trees that grow all the year round. Now in the last slide, some of these are evergreen, like the ones at the bottom, they're all ones that have their, have their, sorry, they're not all of them because the thing jumped when I made the screen, but Scots pine is evergreen, so is juniper, so is yew, for example. And then of course, things like holly and arbutus are evergreen too. So here we have horse chestnut, we all know that one, the one with the, with the conkers. We all know the sycamore with the helicopter seeds. We have the lime tree, which is again a windblown, a windblown seed. The plane, which is kind of like a, it's kind of like a sycamore, but it isn't, it's a different one. We have the beech tree, of course, and larch, which is a coniferous tree, is actually deciduous. It loses its leaves and it gets them back, but it does have cones on it. And then we have lots and lots of evergreen trees, which can grow here all the year round. I mean, I could have lit lashings of them. There's fir and there's spruce. We know them indeed from having these as Christmas trees. And we have the giant redwood, which is the biggest tree in the world, which grows very well. And we have pine trees. So all of these we can see when we're out and about. So how would we know them now? This is the thing, because people like to put names on things. What is the thing? Now, if I meet you, how will I know you? I look at your face and I remember what your face looked like. And therefore, I know that's you. But if I can't see your face, and indeed, we're all getting very good at this now with, with everybody wearing masks, you have to go for other clues instead. You might listen to the sound of somebody's voice. People are always telling me that they tell me they can tell me a mile away because my voice is so recognisable. Other people might have other characteristics that's making them making them recognisable. And it's the same with the trees. If the trees have leaves on them, that's it. That's their faces, if you like. We know what they are. So that's dead easy. But if they haven't got their leaves yet, what are you going to do? So let's try with the easy ones first. Now, we all know this one. There's the leaves. Why is it leaves at this time of the year? Because it's an evergreen tree and it's got prickly leaves. And, and, and in fact, if you look at it and it even has, that's another one there. If it even has flowers on it, sure you're away in a hack altogether. You've got an extra clue for yourself. So what is this tree? This is the holly tree. It's an native tree. It's killing. It's the holly. And holly is one of the trees, in fact, that we get male trees and female trees. And the male trees have male flowers and the female with the pollen on it, and the female trees then are the ones that carry the berries. So that it, unusually other other trees have male and female parts on the same tree, many of them, but the holly doesn't. But anyway, no marks for knowing holly. It'd be very bad if you didn't know that one. 
And now here's another one that has its leaves all the year round. And this one, this is a real clue because they've given you one with berries and everything on it. So this, of course, is the yew tree. And the yew tree, as you can see, has, has evergreen leaves, which are there all the time. And it has these berries on them. They're called arils. In fact, they're a funny sort of a berry, really. They're not the same as other berries. Now, the thing about this tree is that if you think about it, it has an Irish name. It's called on Ewer. And many, many place names are called after the yew tree. And you'd wonder, why are there so many? I mean, the most commonly used tree for place names is the oak on Dar, but the second most common one is the yew tree. Mayo, for example, is called after the yew tree, County Mayo, Mwio, the plain of the yew. You have places like um, Yall, Yoquil, places like Newry, York and Tra. You have places like Terra Newr and Loch and Newr and Glenmalure. These are all called after the yew tree and yet you hardly ever see it now. So why were they so common once when they're not now? And of course, the thing is, they were weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, they used to actually make bows out of the branches of the yew tree because it had a particular type of timber that you could pull it and it wouldn't break the way you couldn't make a bow out of a, a beech tree or something, it would break. And then, of course, when they invented gunpowder in the 1400s and they could kill each other even more effectively than shooting at each other with bows, they took away the yew trees very commonly because they're very, very poisonous. This is the point. So if you had it, you didn't want your animals to be eating the, eating the poisonous leaves or you didn't want them eating the seeds out of it. The only bit of it that isn't poisonous is the red bit around the seed. The seed itself is, is poisonous. So that's how the birds can eat them without collapsing down dead. Now, here's another evergreen one, as you can see, and this one is fierce helpful altogether. Not only has it leaves all the time, but you can get the fruit and the flowers on it at the same time. So this one is, is um, the Arbutus tree. We call it the strawberry tree sometimes because apparently the fruits look like strawberries. Now, mind you, they don't taste. It was okay, it keeps jumping on me. I don't know why it does. There, I'm back again now. The, the, um, the strawberry tree has fl has fruit on it like strawberries, but they don't taste like strawberries. And in fact, the Latin name for it is Arbutus. Arbutus un unido. And unido means one only. And that's because it tastes so horrible. If you ate one, you'd never eat another one. And look, there's the flowers on it as well. And again, a native tree, common. It was actually native to the southwest of the country. And Smerick down in county, in county um, Kerry is called after this particular tree, the Arbutus tree. There's a lovely one growing in RTE. This is the RTE one there. You can see quite a big tree it is, has a lovely sort of a reddish orange bark and it has these leaves on it the whole year round. So these are the, these are the easy ones, what do they call them, the low hanging fruit, the ones that have their leaves all the year round and they're easy to tell. Now here's um, or Scots pine and pine trees have needles on them and the needles are actually inserted into the into the twigs, either in twos or in threes or in fives, depending on the species. So our Scots pine have them in twos. So they pull out one of those needles, they come out in pairs. And that's telling you that it's not one of these other swanky pine trees from other parts of the world, which might have three needles stuck in together or five needles. But if you've only got two needles in pairs, and there's other ones with two needles too, but I mean the chances are it might be it might be one of these um, Scots pines. And while they're called Scots pines, they actually are native Irish species. Scotia was apparently an old Irish, an old Latin name, an old Roman name for Ireland rather than for Scotland. And that's what those trees look like. Aren't they, aren't they great? They nearly look like something you'd see in Africa, you know, with great big branches. They can grow very, very large indeed. And they grew up in the mountains, as I said. There were great forests of those there for about 5,000 years in Ireland. And then the weather changed again. It got colder, it got wetter. Mm. People came, the, the farmers came to Ireland at that stage. Before that, we had Mesolithic people and the Mesolithic people were hunter-gatherers. Whereas the new people, the, the Neolithic peoples who came then, they, they were clearing land in order to grow their crops and to have places for grass for their animals. And with the climate change and they coming and everything else, our pine trees all vanished. So there was only, very recently did we find some of the original ones still in some unfrequented place in County Clare which have the proper DNA of our original ones. So there was great excitement when they were found and they're being cultivated again. You still get the pine forests in Scotland, up in the north of Scotland. 
Right, well, that's the easy stuff now. So you can all wake up now and pay attention because now we're coming to the hard stuff. How can we tell our trees when there are no leaves on them? Here's a tree in the foreground and we can see it's got buds on it and branches. Here's our trees in the background and they're a whole forest of trees and they have no leaves on them either. We're looking at a place in Galway called Diamond Hill. That's Diamond Hill in the background. And... Um, so we have to see what are we going to look at now if we can't actually see the leaves? How? What clues are we going to get? So one of the big clues at this time of the year is to look at the buds. Now the buds are the little lumps on the ends of the branches, if you like, in which we, the leaves for the coming year are. And again, like people coming to school or people coming to meetings or people coming to anything, you have people coming first and people coming last. And it's the same with the trees. Some trees are diminished. It gets anyway half warm at all in March. They're out of their traps and they're beginning to open their buds. And some, like this one you're looking at here, are paddy last and it could be the end of May before they open up their buds. So let's see what we can do if we look at those. Sometimes there's other things on the trees as well besides buds. I mean, looking at the buds on that one, well, no, they're not very, I mean, if you just saw them by themselves, how would you know really what they were? But when you look at that tree, you can see that there's other things on it. There's catkins, there's big, these big long things on them, and there's these things that look like cones. And this is what I was talking about in a way when I was telling you about the holly tree. There are male and female parts. So these catkins are the male parts and the male parts are the parts that have the pollen in them. The pollen is like dust and the pollen has to go from the male part of the tree to the female part of the tree so that seeds can form. In the case of many trees, the wind will blow it. In the case of some trees, the flowers have lovely petals and the insect, the pollinators will carry the pollen instead. So really, if you're going to be effective with catkins, you need to have them hanging out there before the leaves come, because otherwise your pollen will get stuck on the leaves and it won't go where it should go. So this tree is doing its thing. It has its pollen. It has its catkins hanging down with the pollen. And then the female parts, there's last year's ones, which look like little cones. This year's ones are smaller. So your pollen will blow in the wind to the female part, fertilize it, and then the male catkins will fall off and the cones will, will actually swell out. So this is a deciduous tree in Ireland that actually has catkins on it and cones. The only one that we have like this, and it's called the alder tree. A-L-D-E or the alder tree on Farn Oak and it likes to grow in wet places. So if it's quite a wet place, you'll get plenty of, of alder growing. They have um, some kind of bacteria associated with their roots. They're able to fix nitrogen from the air itself rather than wait to be given nitrogen by the farmers or whatever, get it out of the soil. They can take it from the air and they can soak up lots of water. So they grow very well on mineral wet soils. Lots of places in County Cavan have Farney or Farnog in their place names, reflecting that this was a particularly good place in those times when they were given out the place names for, for this sort of thing. Here's another tree with catkins on it. Now I took this myself the other day and obviously I was far too near, half of them are out of focus. But the point is that we're looking at a woodland and all the trees have catkins on it. So what kind of a woodland would have trees full of catkins like this? And of course the answer is a hazel woodland. Hazel trees have catkins and there's your hazel catkins. Now I showed you the alder tree a moment ago and the catkins, the male catkins were like that and the females were the cones. Here the, the, the female things are much are much smaller than that. I'm just going to get rid of all this, these pictures for the moment. I'm looking at something else. And down here at the bottom, you have you have um, the female part of the catkin, the, the female part. So this pollen has to land on the female part and then it swells up. And what does it become? It becomes a hazelnut because you're looking at the hazel tree and these are the catkins on the hazel. And they're all around at the moment. The last picture I showed you was the whole woodland with all of these catkins hanging down. Hazel, a native tree, it's called Col in Irish, and you might know from my accent, I come from County Louth, and in County Louth there is a town called Cullen, and Cullen, C-O-L-L-O-N, is called after the hazel tree. There's probably other trees, other places called after the hazel tree as well, but that's one I can think of. So if you're out and about and you see catkins, have a look, see are there, are there um, 
cones, well, then you're looking at an alder tree, which is a bigger one. If there's like this with little tiny ones with red dots on them, then you're looking at the male and female catkins of the hazel tree. Or if you see something like this, you're looking at a willow tree, pussy willows, because they also have catkins on them. Now, willow trees are coming down in pollen and they're particularly good for bees. So at this time of the year, when our bumblebees are coming out of hibernation to be able to go to some of these willow trees and gather up the pollen put it in your pollen basket see the pollen basket there on the poor bee's back leg it's like as if you were carrying several sacks on your back the bee is collecting the pollen because pollen contains protein and she's bringing it back to the nest to feed the babies with now, obviously, bees themselves, the grown-ups, don't eat baby food. I mean, who eats baby food? Only babies. But the grown-ups want to be eating sugar, and they eat it in the form of honey, so they collect nectar for themselves. And there's no nectar on these particular catkins. They're just a source of, of, of pollen. But what a great source of pollen they are. And if you don't feed the baby, sure, they won't grow up to be adults. So you do need to have grub for them as well. And loads and loads of pollen there. We have about four different native species of willow. And plenty of other willow trees as well that will actually grow in Ireland. I mean, the one that with the big long leaves, they can see weeping willows beside rivers. While that's not a native tree, it is a willow nonetheless and has the same job to do. It'll grow in water. So the Irish word for willow is, is on sal, saliok, sally gardens, sally rods. All kinds of sallies are called after the, the willow tree. Now, I mean, after telling you that they don't do their thing before their leaves, here's one that wasn't listening when I was giving out the rules, because this one has its catkins and the leaves are on later as well and the catkins are still there. Now, I told you we had two two birch trees in, in on our list and this is one of the birch trees and you can see, you can see that it also has catkins. In fact, I see there's mm -hmm. even a green fly on the catkin. So you might say, well, now that's not fair. How are we supposed to know them when, when there's no leaves on them? But there's other clues with the birch and one of the clues with the birch, I happen to picture up here now, but one of the clues with the birch is that it's a silver birch and the back of the birch is a lovely silver bark so if you look at the bark if you have catkins and it's not definitely isn't a willow and it definitely isn't a hazel and it definitely isn't an alder look at the bark and see if you've got this lovely silver bark because it very well might be it might be a birch tree now here's a bud that I here's a here's a here's a branch that I've grown right across and this is the branch is meant to be in focus so I was looking at this the other day saying now what on earth could that possibly be here's the here's the buds and if you look at the markings on this the markings on the twig really give it away there's a closer look at the same twig look at it and these are like little horseshoes it's like as if a horse was walking all over your tiny little baby horse was walking all over the branch because all along the branch, you have these little horseshoe shaped marks. And this tells us, of course, that this is a cron canoe couple. This is a horse chestnut. And horse chestnuts, you know, they're called horse chestnuts because it looks like a horse walks in them. Well, that's not actually why they're called horse chestnuts. And these are just the, the leftover scars from last year's leaves. But they do look like little horseshoes, even with the little nails keeping the horseshoe on. Now, the, the, um, Horse chestnut is not a native tree to Ireland. People loved it so much in other countries, they brought it over and planted it here. It came from further south in Europe. So the poor old, the poor old horse chestnut thinks that it's further south than it is. So it's the very first of these trees to actually get its leaves. And already, I went out yesterday to see what I might see. And look, they're burst. And you can see they're opened. And here come out the leaves. And Brendan was slagging me about my picture for this particular webinar because I was holding up he said autumn leaves yeah it was but the autumn leaves I was holding up were the leaves of the horse chestnut and you can see they're like a hand they have seven little leaves on them so this one doesn't even wait till the end of March before it opens up it's the first one to come of these big trees and it's the first one to go as well by September it's looking very shook altogether because obviously it's out first and it's, 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 it doesn't last as long so if you can find a tree with horseshoe shaped buds on it Sorry, but horseshoe marks on it and the buds are beginning to open. Have a look at the leaves. It's more than likely your cron canoe couple and make a note of where it is, because obviously by the time autumn comes, you'll be going off to collect conkers from it, which is, of course, great. Now, here's one and it's tightly shut. This thing doesn't look like it's ever going to open. In fact, it reminds me of the toe of a sheep. 
it's the only tree we have with black buds. The buds are every colour only black, but this particular tree has black buds and it's paddy last. This thing doesn't bother its head, open itself up until it's the summer is here. And right, okay, that's fine. And then you go off and look for this and you find this. And you think, what was that one all about? Look, there it is, open. But look and look and look what's open. It's not the leaves, it's not the bud at the end that's open. There are these buds down along the edge. And they're flower buds. And they've opened up and they've let out the flowers. And look what mad looking flowers they have. There's no petals on them as such, the way you would expect with daisies and dandelions and things in your garden. Because again, we're looking at ones that are pollinated by the wind. And again, it has to do its thing before the leaves come or the pollen won't go to the right place. This is an ash tree on Finchog. And the ash tree is, is the very last one. Now there's a, an expression in Ireland, the oak before the ash, we'll have a dash. And the ash before the oak, we'll have a soak. And this refers to what kind of a summer we're going to have. So if the oak tree is out first, it's out before the ash, and we'll only have a dash of rain. It'll be a grand summer. And if the ash is out first, the ash before the oak, we'll have a soak, a little lash rain all summer long. And why do you'd like to believe that? Of course it isn't true, because in most cases, the oak tree is out first, the oak before the ash, and we don't always have a wonderful summer. So this thing, it could be it could be the end of May before this thing opens up its leaves in actual fact. So if you're out now and you see these black buds and you see this kind of a carry on, it's not that I'm wrong. Would I be wrong? No. But what I, what you're looking at are the flower buds opening rather than rather than the terminal buds. So black buds, maybe with the flower leaves open. After all, in the autumn time, what kind of seeds do we get on the ash? We get keys. They're in bunches and the wind blows them away again. So this one is very heavily dependent on the wind. It likes to grow where the soil is good, nice rich soil. And unfortunately, um, our ash trees have been affected by uh, ash dieback, which is a terrible disease that we have because all of our hedgerows have ash trees in them and they're very common. Even in cities, they'll grow. <coughs> so it's a pity if this disease is going to get rid of them all. So we have to be worried about that. But so, so far, there's plenty of them around and you'll be able to go and see them. Now, again, I was saying, um, well, if you can see the whole tree, maybe there's clues. So we're looking at this great big tree and we can see we can see the bark on it, a big, a big gnarled back bark on the tree, on the trunk. Maybe that's a clue. There's another two of them. I mean, these are off the Internet and they're stretched a bit. But then the thing is that the older the tree get, the more gnarled the bark is. So it could be an old tree of very many different species. So you can't really depend on the bark in most cases. You can in, in, in the beach because it has a lovely grey bark. But these big gnarledy barks, it could be anything. If you can see the leaves, obviously, as I said, you're away in a hack. But at this time of the year, you're not going to see leaves on this tree but you're going to see the buds and there's one on somebody's hand and you can see, unlike all the other ones that I showed you so far, this particular tree has more than one bud at the end. There's a whole bunch of buds at the end of each twig. So it's not just one bud like I showed you with the ash or I showed you with the horse chestnut or I showed you with any of the other ones we looked at earlier on. This one has a whole collection of terminal buds that gives it away. So you won't get leaves on this at the moment. But if you look at the buds and you see a whole gang of them there all together, you're looking at an oak tree. You will get the leaves like I showed you. They may grow up to be huge trees because oak trees can live 300 years growing. I mean, and they could be around for another 300 mm -hmm. after that. They're long-lived trees, the oak are, but um, the buds are always like this and they open out later in the year. So it'll be May probably before our buds open out. You can check, is it out before the ash tree or what's happening there? But nonetheless, that's what it's going to look like. So that's your, that's your oak tree. And of course, the oak tree then will go on then to have acorns on it. And acorns then are food for birds. Jays like acorns and so do crows and so do squirrels. They'll all gather the acorns and mice. They'll all use these as food. So it's a fine tree to have. For this, the Irish for the oak, of course, is on Dar, and again, Kildare, Kildara, the Church of the Oak, Derry, Kundadira, it's the, the county called after the oak. And then there's lots and lots of places, beginning with Derry, Derry Conaghy and Derry this and Derry that and Derry the other, all called after the oak tree because it was such a common tree in Ireland for though, for though. Now, here's another tree. 
This tree has thorns on it. We can look at the thorns sticking along here now. There's not that many trees with thorns on them, so you have a few to look at now. I'm talking about native trees again. So we have blackthorn, we have hawthorn. Um, how would you know which was which? How would you know whether this was a hawthorn or a blackthorn? Well, you wouldn't. But if you saw a blackthorn, you would, because the blackthorn trees, this one also has thorns, great big thorns on it, darker timber. It's a member of the, of the plum family. But the thing about the blackthorn tree is it gets its flowers first before the leaves. And they're beginning to come out now at the end of March. It's a very, very early one. So suddenly in fields around the country, you get these lumps of hedges with white flowers on them and no leaves. So if your thorny bush or your thorny tree has flowers on it, it's a black thorn at this time of the year. If it has nothing, it's just sitting there sulking with thorns and buds that are doing nothing. Well, its time hasn't come yet and it's obviously then not a blackthorn tree. So these flowers, as you can see, have petals on them, have, have stamens with pollen in it, they contain nectar and they're, they're showing off entirely in order to get insect to come flying their pollinating species like flies and bees and bumblebees and anything that can fly at this time of the year to come and visit these flowers and drink the nectar as, as a reward. Maybe collect the pollen to bring it back if you remember the bee family. And in doing this, what happens, of course, is that fertilization happens and later on in the year we get the fruit. And what is the fruit of the blackthorn tree called? The fruit of the blackthorn tree are called sloes. And I remember when I was in school, me and Finn McCool about a million years ago, we used to have competitions eating sloes to see who could eat a slow without making a face because they are the sourest things there. I mean, I wouldn't recommend eating them because they probably give you a massive pain. But I mean, if you put one in your mouth and even bite it, your mouth dries up, there's so, so much acid in it. And of course, what county and what um, place in Ireland is called after the slow? And it's not Ballin' a slow, that's Bailaw and the Slua. It's Killarney, because the Irish word for the slow is Arna. And the Church of the Slows, Killarney down in County Kerry, are called after the slow. So if your thorny tree has berries, has if your thorny tree has flowers on it and no leaves, it's a black thorn. If it has thorns on it and nothing else, so sitting there sulking, it's more mm. than likely to be a hawthorn tree. Now it's I was saying um, the horse chestnut was the first one to get its leaves. And if you go out, you'll see this. And it's definitely patently isn't a horse chestnut. So what am I on about now? Well, the thing is, I was showing you my woodland at the beginning, if you remember, the birch woodland with the, with the lovely bluebells underneath. And there's actually a hierarchy of how things happen in a woodland. So the leaves fall off completely in the winter time. There's no leaves at all. The light shines through your woodland down to the floor of the forest and your flowers come out. So our early, our early flowers happen in the woodland. So you get wild garlic, you get bluebells, you get primroses because there is enough light for them. And then, of course, what happens then is the smaller trees have an advantage because they come out first because it's still bright, the leaf canopy hasn't closed and there's a bit of a light to give them a start. So this is a small tree that would grow low down in the woodland and it gets a bit of light before the canopy closes. So it has to take advantage of this light before the canopy closes so that it can grow its leaves. So that's really what's happening there because when the canopy up high closes, when the leaves come on the oak trees or on the ash trees or on the beech trees, whatever your canopy is, there'll be much less light in the woodland for the smaller trees. This is an elder tree. Trim is the Irish word for an elder. And the elder tree is beginning to get its leaves at this time of the year. This is one I have in my own back garden here in Dublin. And you can see the leaves are coming out on it. And it has um, very soft timber on it. There's all sorts of stories associated with the elder tree, in fact. And um, the Irish for it, Trim, Trim, Trim and County Mead is actually called after the, the, this, this particular tree, Bailaha Trim. And um, it's considered to be to be kind of a tree of evil. I mean, there's talks about stories about it being the tree on which Judas hanged himself or which the cross the, on Jesus was crucified was made from. These are not true stories. They're only pish rogues, really. But it, the poor old elder tree has a bad reputation. Those of you that know about Harry Potter, Harry Potter was the good wizard, you know, in, in the Harry 
Potter stories and the bad wizard who was he, he was Voldemort and Voldemort had his wand made of nasty timbers and one of the nasty timbers in Voldemort's, war, in Voldemort's wand was made from elder. Now what did Harry Potter have in his wand? I don't know whether we might come across any of those or not, but he wouldn't be having Elder in it because he was a goody goody. So the Elder leaves come on. Then I suppose maybe at the end of June, we're going to get the lovely Elder flowers. And then in the autumn, we get the Elder berries, which the birds love as well. So this is kind of early, giving itself a little nod in the race, giving itself going because it doesn't grow ever very large and it makes takes advantage of the low down light. Here's a sycamore tree. And again, sycamore is not native to Ireland. Sycamore comes from further south in Europe. So some sycamore trees are beginning to open already. And once you get a look at the leaves at all, you can you can know what it is. So you can see what happens. Your bud, the terminal bud, just one of them, begins to burst. These leaves are all folded up inside in it. And then eventually they'll burst open. Lots of red pigments in sycamore. You often get extra bits of red. In fact, the stalks of the leaves of the sycamore quite often often have red stalks on them. That's how we know they're sycamore rather than say a maple or some other species of that same kind of plant. So lots of sycamores about because they, the seeds of the sycamores, I'm sure you all know, are helicopters. And the helicopter seeds fly off in the wind and land up on roofs of people's houses and grow in the gutters and grow everywhere. And people tend to think of them as a bit of a weed more than anything else. And they don't really want them because what is a weed after all? Only a plant that you don't want. But your sycamore can grow very, very well in Ireland. And in fact, it, it, it doesn't, it's not so very fussy, really. So you get it growing by the seaside. It won't grow very well with the salty wind, but it will grow, which is more than some other trees will do. So your sycamore then can grow in places that other trees can't put up with it. So that's your sycamore there. And there's no really Irish word for sycamore because it isn't native. What's the Irish for sycamore? Sycamore, spelt with an S-E-I-C rather than S-Y. Now we're down to the buds. This is no help here at all. Here are the buds. But if you look at the buds, see how different they are to any other buds I showed you. These are like needles. In fact, if you put your finger on top of one of them, you could make your finger nearly bleed if you poked it hard enough. So there's only one tree with brown buds that are like needles and this is the beech tree. The beech tree is um, unfair. It was actually brought to Ireland by by the Normans they tell us. Do you wonder why are the Normans bringing beech trees to Ireland? No, the beech has beech nuts on it and it was brought by, by animals further north in Europe after the Ice Age melted. It got as far as Britain because Britain was another thousand years joined to France before the English Channel opened up. So there's more native trees in Britain than there are in Ireland because there was more time for them to arrive. So the beech trees are just beech woodlands actually in, in Britain and they're native there. So um, when the Normans came to Ireland from Britain, they were familiar with those. Now, why did they want beech trees? After all, they could kill people with the bows that they had from the yew and were plenty of yew in Ireland. They, they, they use oak trees to build ships and we had plenty of oak trees. So well, what's wrong with them? Why are they bringing a tree? And the reason why they're bringing the tree is because the Normans were the first builders. And to this day, if you look around Ireland, you can see still lots and lots of castles that started off in the Norman times. So when did the Normans come to Ireland? Hands up. They came in 1169, which is Oh, more than a thousand, nearly a thousand years ago now. And those castles, a lot of them are still around now. They're just, we just see the stone of them. We don't necessarily see the entire castle. They may only be ruins. And of course, the Normans might have built them. Then other people lived in them afterwards and minded them and did them up and whatever else. But the reason why they wanted the timber were for the roofs of those castles. The roofs were made of wood. The floors were made of wood in some cases. And the timber of the beach was particularly good for this. So this, we think, is one of the reasons why they were brought over by, by the... By the um, the Normans. They're here for so long. They have an Irish name. They're called Fa If you are, if you're on the if you're on the on the Lewis in Dublin and you stop at Beechwood, it's Quilna Fa. They tell us what it's called. So it's an Irish word, a definite Irish word, rather than a made up one like Sycamore. But um, 
it grows really, really well in Ireland. And we have lots of beech woodlands. I mean, there's a beech woodland now in the autumn time. I know it's not autumn now, but I'm just showing it to you because the, the, the trunks of the trees are so distinctive. I was saying other trees like the oak or the ash or whatever, they can get very gnarled tree, trunks and you might know which one is which. But these ones are always smooth. They're always smooth and grey and they grow very straight up. Sometimes they fork, which isn't good, but you get lots, you can see lots of timber in a, in a a trunk like that and then these lovely leaves later on and they throw a very dense shade so what I was saying if you're if when the leaves are on the trees there's not much light for other things to grow underneath so this is why in a woodland at this time of the year you have all the stuff on the floor of the woodland busily growing while they have light and then you have you have the smaller trees taking advantage of the light as well. This is the silver birch. I don't know how it got over here. That was meant to be over beside the other birch leaves that I was showing you. And you can see, you can see immediately, even though there isn't a flitter of a leaf on it, you can see exactly what, what your stem looks like. You can see the lovely silver colour of it. And we have two birch trees in Ireland. We have the silver birch and we have the downy birch. But the silver birch in particular has this, this lovely, this lovely um, bark on it. And um, it's a wind blown when the seeds are blown by the wind. So that was one of the earlier trees to come to Ireland because the wind was able to blow it. So the birds with, who were doing the poos with the seeds and then were landed on the branches of trees like this and did their droppings. But um, on be is the Irish word for, for the birch tree and places like Kilbehany and Valley Bay and places like this, these are actually called after, after the birch tree itself. And of course, if your birch tree looks like this, which it can very well do, it doesn't mean that a collection of crows or rooks or something have taken up residence. These are not nests. People tell me these are nests and we stand and look at them. And I said, do you ever see a bird going in and out of one of those? And later on in the year, you'll actually see leaves growing on them. These are not nests. These are things, and they've a great name. These are things called a witch's broom. And the witch's broom is actually a disease of the poor old birch tree. And what happens is normally trees grow and they get their branches and the branches divide and divide and then they stop. But this thing gets a virus in it, this witch's broom virus, and the branches divide and divide and divide and they don't know when to stop. So you kind of have you kind of have this collection of, of, of branches, like, like the bird's nest really, but they're alive. So as I said, later on when the leaves come, they'll have leaves on them too. So they're called witches' brooms. I don't know, witches must be very clean, always sweeping up things, I don't know. But that's what they're called. And it's a disease of birch trees and nothing else. So if you have this lovely, lovely silver bark, if you happen to have a collection of these stuck in the tree as well, you don't have to wait for the leaves to know what it is. You don't have to worry about catkins and leaves at the same time, because you know for definite this is a birch tree and you can show off and say, and these are not bird's nests. In the learn said rubbish, they're not bird's nests. These are witches' brooms and they, they look great, don't they? It doesn't kill the tree, actually. The tree just gets more and more of them, but it doesn't actually kill the tree. So it's a very characteristic thing on them. And then, of course, we have other trees, like there's a collection of trees just sitting there. What are they? They're not going to have any leaves for a while. But if we look at them, we can see that the shape of the tree, if you so you're this is getting into the honor stuff now, the shape of the tree will tell us. So these, these trees have branches all the way down along to the bottom. This is a, 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 um, a stand of lime trees. Now, lime trees again were introduced into Ireland by, by people who thought they were lovely trees, which they are, they're lovely trees. And they plant them quite often as avenues or like you see here, sort of a, a, a driveway up to up to a field or up to a house or up to something and where the house is there now. But I mean, the, the trees are still there even if the house isn't. And they have, when the leaves come on in the summertime, they, they actually look like they're wearing skirts because the whole tree has leaves all the way down to the bottom. Quite often we know what trees are. You have the trunk and then you have the leaves. But in the case of the lime trees, they, they, they actually, the leaves are all the way down to the bottom. So in this time of the year, you can see where the leaves are going to grow, these extra sticks and spits and twigs and things, which is where the leaves will be later on. And this gives us a clue then that these are actually lime trees. They're not the limes like lemons and limes. They're not those kind of lime trees. The linden tree is the name of them abroad. There's a whole street in, in, in Berlin, which has these trees growing along us and they call it after it, Unterden Linden. But um, 
Linden is the name of it in another language, but we have it here in Ireland as well. And of course, it grows very well, as you can see. So anyway, but I mean, you know, we could go on forever. As I said, we have 28 native tree species, but there's lots and lots of other ones as well. So the importance of trees, there's lots of reasons why we should grow trees. And these are the various reasons why I was starting at the bottom, where I was telling you about our mental health set that I was showing you the picture of Eamon the Butler, who said, if we're out and about and we're looking at trees, you're always going to be interested in things. So it's so silly to go out walking in the woodlands, which are earphones in and marching along at the speed of light trying to get 10,000 steps done. You're not getting the value out of the walk you're having at all. I told you about biodiversity. I explained to you that the ones that had loads of creepy crawlies attached to them, not, not doing them any harm, living there, there is living space for them. Creepy crawlies might be eating some of the leaves and not going to eat the whole lot. You, you have spiders on the leaves eating the green flies that are eating the leaves. You have you have plants growing on them. You have you have things like birds building nests in them. You have mice maybe or squirrels in them as well. So <coughs> there'd be huge areas for other animals to live in. Water uptake. Trees, you need a huge amount of water. The roots take up the water, goes right up through the tree, and then it's evaporated through the leaves. So at this time of the year, when they don't have leaves, they're beginning to wake up. They're beginning to they're beginning to think we better start growing. It's getting warm. And there's an expression, you know, spring is when the sap rises in the trees. So does the sap rise in the trees? Well, if you're over in Canada and you're looking at something like um a maple tree, the sap rises in the tree and the tap it and they give us maple syrup. But even in Ireland, all our trees will, will, will be doing this as well. So if you put your arms around the tree and put your ear to it, you might actually hear this happening. And then if you have trees growing with lots of roots everywhere, it stops the soil being washed away. So it stops soil erosion. Soil erosion is a bad thing. It's awful to have your soil washed away by the rain. So if your trees are growing there, holding on to the soil, this won't happen. And then this one here, this carbon capture, this is what trees do. This is what plants do. They carry out photosynthesis. What's that? That's what the leaves do. They actually take the carbon dioxide in the air and they capture it and they keep the carbon, which is turned into timber, and they give off the oxygen. So carbon dioxide is a molecule with carbon and oxygen joined together up in the air. And what does carbon dioxide do? It takes in heat from the sun and we'll have more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The world is getting warmer and warmer and we're having climate change. If you could get rid of some of it out of the atmosphere, it would be great. And what does it? Trees do it. Trees do it very well because they save all the carbon in their in their timber. And even if you cut it down and use your timber for to make furniture or houses or roofs or whatever you're doing with it, the carbon will stay there. So they're really important from a point of view of ca capturing carbon. So all of these things are good reasons why we should be planting trees. And just a few swanky trees to show off now. Here's the tallest tree in Ireland, the Douglas fir in Paris Court, which is 57 litres. And that's because it's, it's an evergreen tree. It can grow all the year round. So it's a head start on other things. And this is, um, this is, the, this is the, this, the, the spruce tree down in Curramore and Waterford. And it's head and shoulders above the other ones as well. And again, it's a Sitka spruce. It's 55 metres high. And that's where it is. Here's the sequoia, the joint sequoia that the redwood, which are the biggest trees in the world from California, and they'll grow here. That looks like it's bigger than the waterfall, but I don't actually think it's actually bigger than the waterfall. It's just a perspective of looking at it. And this is the strawberry tree down in Muckris, the one I was telling you about, that you need, though, that has the flowers and the strawberries on it at the same time. And... This is our tallest ash tree and it's only 40 metres tall because it only grows for half the year. When the leaves fall off, it can't grow. So that's it. That's the, the tallest native tree, our, our ash tree. And our, the holly, even our holly trees, so you think our small little trees, the largest holly in Ireland is 12 metres high, which is, what, 36, nearly 40 feet. So, you know, you could well climb up a holly tree if you wanted to. So even, even holly trees can grow tall if they're left, if they're left to grow. Anyway, that's the end of my story. I've written a new book, I have to tell you. It's coming out next week. It's called Our Wild World. And it's from the birds and the bees to the boglands and the ice caps. So if you didn't get enough of me, you can rush out and get this as well. There'll be more about it next week when they actually launch it. O'Brien Press is doing it. Well, that's my story. So I'm going to hand you back now to Brendan and I'm going to stop sharing. I should appear again now. Thank you all very much for listening to me. Here I am back again. Yeah, okay. Brendan, over to you.
Yeah, I'm just trying to get my videos. Yeah, here I am. Okay, first of all, that's, thank you very much for that talk, Ina. It's getting very good reaction from the, the comments. But before, before I go any further, I would like to give a shout out to the third class Nipporic National School in Moylock, who have been listening rapt attention to your, your talk. So hello to everybody in Moylock. Um, I had a few questions here. Uh, one you may have dealt with is, why do some trees, you know, like cherries and pears and so on, put their fl flowers out before their leaves in the spring? I, I was, why did they put them out? Well, I mean, why do they do it? Because obviously it works. They're out early if they're out before the leaves, like the whole, like the blackthorn, I was saying. And mm. it gives them an opportunity to be ahead of the posse. So your early insects coming out are definitely going to go to them because mm. they, they, there's nothing else about. Many trees need the, need the leaves first in order to have the strength to put out flowers. But some of our early, early blossom trees are pears and apple trees and indeed the blackthorn. It's a risk, of course, because if you get terrible frosts and there are, the flowers are destroyed by the frosts in April, you mightn't have any fruit at all. But on the other hand, you get first dibs, you get first dibs at the insects if you're the only, if you're the only food around. So it's a survival thing, really. Okay, I'd, I'd also like to mention Rath Down School in Plenagiri and Rath School in, it's jumped on me, Baltimore in West Cork, obviously. Uh, all of them listening attentively. Uh, now, I have one other I question. I have a question here, no, just one, Brendan. Somebody wants to know, how did I get your out of yo for mayo? Yes, that was the question I was going to ask you. Oh, were you going to ask that one, really? Yes, yeah, I because, was. Because... If I wanted to know that, I'd be raging if so no one answered it. We, yo, we, we is a plane. And, and I'm going to give you a, a lecture in the Irish language now because it's the Tishel Guinness job. Your is the nominative on your, but then if you're talking about the plane of the yew trees in plural, then you have to go for we yo because eo is the way we pronounce the tree, the plane of more than one yew tree. So tear on your, terra on your is the, the, the countryside of one yew tree. But we yo is the plane of the yew trees. They must have been mighty men with the bows over in Mayo if they had a whole plane of them. Okay, there's, there's uh, one or two more. Uh, I hadn't heard this one before. Somebody wants to know, is it true that lime trees attract rats? Or maybe it was repel rats. Oh, no. <laughs> I have no idea. Why would they attract rats? I have no idea either, but I think that was... Lime trees have lovely flowers on them and they're very good for bees. Bees, yeah. bees love lime trees. So I know I, it's not true. I'm going to stick out my neck. It's not true that they, they attract rats. Rubbish. Okay, here's an easy one. Are apple trees native? There is one of them is anyway. Well, the, the crab apple is native. The crab apple tree is malus. That's the one that we have the crab, the wild apples in, in the hedges. The actual eaten apple apparently came from Asia or somewhere like that. And it's it's a different tree, in fact. I mean, it's the same apple, but but the actual eaten apple didn't come from smarting up the crab apple. It's, it's an actual different, a different tree. So, so uh, Matthew Jeb in the Botanic Gardens tells me because he was talking about this at one stage. But it's National Tree Week, so this is the week to go out and plant trees. So you can plant bare-rooted trees up until the end of March or just around now, but you can always plant a tree in a pot. You don't have to wait until next year to plant it. A tree in a pot can be planted at any time and you can see what a good thing it is to do to plant trees and that's what well, you should all be doing. Any more uh, questions there, uh, Brendan? Another, another thank you from the boys in third and fourth of St. Joseph's School in Boyle, County Roscommon. So you've got a broad audience from across the country. Well, good. I hope I hope I didn't talk too quickly and gavel away too fast, but anyway, I did my best. Okay. Do you know where the oldest yew tree in Ireland is? And then Manute is a prompt given. Well, yes, there's, there's various discussions about that. There's, there's the, the tree as you go into Minute University, it was in this, yeah. called the Silken Thomas U, and it's supposed to have been there at the time of Thomas and Shea, the way back in the 1500s. There's a very old yew tree, isn't there, down below in Muckwas in County, in County Kerry, and... Um, that one is. Just it's growing in the middle of an old abbey, I think. That's it? right. That came in from Inish Fallon in 1197. Yeah. So that there's talk about that. The trouble is, you see, in, you can tell the age of a tree by counting the rings. 
first of all, you have to have the rings. Yep, so the tree is dead. That's not much good. But sometimes you can core them by sticking a little core in and pulling out a little sliver and count the rings that way. But you can't with the yew because the yew tree, the inside of the yew tree dies while it grows from the outside. So the tree is perfectly alive, might be hollow in the middle and you can't count the rings. So we can't know for definite. Okay, a few more school shout outs, uh, Aina. Um, thanks for your great talk. Fifth and sixth class in Winnefluch National School, Croom. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, also from the senior room in the Glebe in Ockram and uh, third and fourth class in Dunsany, County Meath. Want to know how long you have been learning about trees? Well, look. I've been learning about trees all my life, haven't you? I mean, people are always asking me this. They want to know, when did you stop learning about trees? Why do you think I just started? I'm so old that when I was young, television hadn't been invented. And we were told to go out and play and don't come in unless you're bleeding. So that was our playground. And we went out and we quickly learned which trees were good to climb and which trees weren't. You don't really climb elder trees. They tend to break. Not a good idea. And then, of course, you climbed up trees and you couldn't get down again, which is pretty awkward. And we knew where the birds' nests were and we knew which ones got their leaves first, all of that, because we went out and played. And you can do so too. It's not rocket science. It's just great fun. Yeah, another question here. Are lime trees native? No, they didn't quite make it here either when the land bridge disappeared. No, they were planted but by the gentry as avenues and they can look very well in the landscape. They are they very to suited there. to the climate, yeah. 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 Um, what would climate change do to our woodlands and native plants in future? That is from Carmel Wright. You want to say that yourself, Brendan, you've been a forester by trade. Well, it's it's hard to know. I mean, it depends exactly what happens, but clearly the impact could be fairly devastating. That's why it's very, very important that we get climate under control. Uh, and we have about, what, 30 years, 2050, to keep the um, uh, warming to 1.5 degrees above what it was before the Industrial uh, Revolution. And if we fail to do that, we could be in a situation of runaway global warming and then literally all the bets are off every every yeah, but one of the, one of the things cold. about about climate change and the what would the country getting warmer is that other trees can grow that couldn't grow before i'm just thinking of things like say the walnut tree you never could get mm -hmm. walnuts to ripen wasn't warm enough i'm thinking of other other trees that 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 you know, couldn't grow here at an earlier stage because it was too cold. I know they're doing very well here as a consequence. On the other hand, climate change is given more sucker to, to various diseases. So some of our trees are not doing well because the diseases can survive over the winter as the winters aren't as cold as they used to be. So it swings and roundabouts really. Some trees can do better here because it's warmer and some trees can do worse. But what we do need is more trees to suck the carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. And, stop the climate and I think it's important to say we need more trees of all sorts. Uh, oh, of all sorts. Trees are fantastic. Yeah. But again, the question is, will the native trees we have, the climate isn't the same as when they arrived here. Uh, it could be very different in 30 or 50 years time. So I think we should not put all our eggs in one basket and be, you know, fairly... Uh, broad in our consideration of what trees are suitable. A lot of trees are extremely suitable for the climate as it is today. They've never made it here. I'm talking about beech, sycamore, lime, and so on and so forth. I mean, they, they all grow very well, you know, so that why not plant them indeed? So it just depends on what's going to grow. Any tree is better than no tree. Now, uh, let me see. There's another one here. What have all trees got in common? That's come from... Selen in Clara National School. Well, we should nearly ask Selen what he means by that. What have they got in common? They're made of wood. Mm -hmm. They've got leaves. They, they can take carbon out of the atmosphere and they look great. I don't know. I mean, maybe he has a particular answer. And if he has, if it's a riddle or something, let him type it in so that we'll know the answer. I don't think they have in common because they all do the same thing. They're the same type of plant, really, you know. And without going to question, Caroline Stewart, I can tell you myself that that is a Himalayan birch. You almost certainly have. <laughs> there is a thank you from Holy Trinity National School in Dunfanaghy. Um, and also fifth and sixth class of the Presentation Monastery in Killarney, uh, who are lucky to have Killarney National Park right beside them. Indeed, they are. St. Bridget's of Valley Sachs on the Curra, sixth class. And... Fourth class, Milltown National School, Belturbet, County Cavan. And 
Eva Dingham asks, what is the tallest oak in Ireland, Dana? Oh, I'd have to look in my champion trees book to find that out. We have a we have a book here that we've done in the tree council, and um, I think it's called the Squire's Walking Stick, and it's an oak tree that grows down in in County Offaly, down down there where where you have these these lovely oak trees belonging to the, the big landed estates down there of the, the 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 Earl of Ross, and one of them is called the Squire's Walking Stick because it has such a huge long stem of a trunk before you get the branches on the top. That's probably our tallest tree. And um, you the Himalayan the Himalayan um, birch. I I was just that's the one that has the really really shiny bark. But yeah, the one with, very the one the one with the with the witch's brooms is definitely an ordinary birch, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, the hill main birch, birch is the garden and it had a very white bark, so that was that. Uh, should we only plant native trees is a question from an anonymous attendee. Well, we should plant trees, any kind of trees. I mean, obviously, it depends on where you're planting them. Now, there's a whole thing about planting trees as a crop, planting trees for timber, planting trees that we can harvest, and we want that as quickly as possible. So this is why we have forests of Sitka spruce, lodgepole pine, trees that we can harvest for that. And that's a job, the same way as you plant, plant a field of barley or wheat or something of that order. It's a crop, it's an industry, and it provides timber for building. Building Irish houses with. So if you're in that line of business, obviously that's what you should be planting. If you're at home in your garden and you want a nice tree in the garden, you mightn't even plant a native tree at all. You might plant something like a, a Japanese maple that's going to have the most gorgeous flowers in the autumn time. You might like to do that. You might want to plant a pear tree to have something to eat, or you might then want to plant a native tree as well. So you can't just say, only those 28 and no more. It depends where you're planting them and for what reason. So I can't, I can't say yes or no. It's a qual. I'm getting like a politician now, but there are all sorts of different reasons to plant trees. Well, okay. If I could press you for a, for a, a, a less equivocal answer on this one, uh, Emily and Jake would like to know what your favorite tree is. My favorite tree. I don't know. It changes. When I was young, my favourite tree was the one I could climb up to the top of. And then mm. when I when I bought my own house, I planted um, a white bean tree because they have the most gorgeous leaves. They're the most pale green leaves. And then my kids used to climb up that and it was their favourite tree. Then the thing got huge and we had to remove it and nearly took away the house. So at the moment, I have a lovely spindle tree in the garden. But my favourite tree is the one I'm looking at and it gladdens my heart. So it, it depends if I'm looking at an oak tree and it's a gorgeous tree I'm looking at that if I'm in, in those beach woodlands I showed you and this whistle and the sound. So again, an equivocal answer. I can't say this is my favourite tree and I hate all the others because that's not the case. No. Okay, Mark Reed's asking, should we plant more native deciduous rather than Sitka spruce? Well, I think, Mark, to, to go because somebody else asked, are, is Ireland one of the least wooded in Europe? We are indeed 11%. The European average is over 30% and only Malta in the EU has a uh, a lower tree cover. So there's lots of room, more than enough room for all trees. Obviously, we need the Sitka to produce, keep the whole industry going, to build our houses with and all the rest of it, and, and indeed to pay for the uh, native woodland programme. So uh, the answer to that, I suppose, is we need both. Um, they have then a question from McKean Hendrick. How do trees speak to each other, Aina? They don't. They're all trees. How would they speak? They haven't got tones. They, they communicate underground in, in with their um, various... Yeah, well, you know, something, that's a whole different thing. I mean, you know, trees are trees. They don't communicate with each other. They, they fight, if you like, in a sense, because what happens is if a tree can grow stronger than the other tree and gets all the light, the other one doesn't get enough light. If they're too near together, one gets all the moisture and the other one doesn't. So they don't seem to communicate in a friendly way. It's kind of survival of the fittest, like anything in nature. Like everybody else, yeah. So, OK. Uh, what's the best tree for the seaside? Well, something that will put up, put up with salt, I suppose. I was saying sycamore can tolerate salt, I, I know, oh, and yeah. other ones as well. Um, I see they grow, they grow um, New Zealand flax. I mean, salt, salt is desperate. I mean, you see hawthorn growing along by the coast as well, and one side all burnt by the sea, and the thing all going to one side. You see them in Connemara and places like that. Seaside is not the salty winds. It's, it's hard to tolerate salty winds, really. Okay, now thanks from Fifth Class and Esker Educate Together and Lucan. Um, they enjoyed the presentation and 
do we need more willow trees to save the bees? Well, I know lime trees, which we were talking about earlier, are a tremendous tree for the bees. Uh, have you any idea? Oh, yeah, because they, they contain nectar as well. And willow trees are grand too. I mean, we need more things with food in it to save the bees. So even the dandelions, so stop going out and cutting the heads off dandelions. Let them flower. Take away the seed heads if you don't want them. So we just need more wildflowers in general, whether they're on trees or whether they're not. It doesn't matter. We just need more of them for our bees and indeed other insects. Okay, yeah. Tammy Cox from the Queen of the Universe National School in Bagmanstown, Carlo. Uh, Thanks you for that. And the best fiction book about trees is The Overstory by Richard Powers. I'm not familiar with that one. I don't know if you are, Aina. No, but I mean, that's it's always great to get a recommendation. So it's called The Overstory, is it? By, it's by, called The Overstory by a yeah. gentleman called Richard Powers. Well, I must I must look that up or anything. Anything you can learn is a good day when you learn something new. OK, and uh, let's see. I so have missed any here. Um, uh, Skull Namukli Clonakilty just said thanks. A beautiful acacia tree in the church grounds in Lucan. Can you say something about it? No, uh, I don't know this. Don't know. Tree. But acacia trees come from Africa. They're an African tree, and again, they have they have very short, hard leaves on them. I know the giraffes have a, take a great shine to them over in Africa. I've seen them on the plains over there. So, as another example of how, even though we since far from Africa, we are in Lucan, things will actually grow here mm. because we're such a good country for growing trees. And we're running out of steam now, but why do people cut down trees on the side of the road, even if they are not in danger of falling over? Well, I think I had explained in a private answer to somebody that we have a big problem in the Republic with our tree preservation order system, which needs to be radically overhauled and that needs changes to the Forestry Act. So anyone who's interested in preserving like specimen trees in you know, outside the forest context, uh, you should really be lobbying your politicians to sort that out. Uh, Somebody wants the best plant to treat in a small garden. Well, it really would depend on the garden, I suppose. It's hard to yeah, say. We, we, we have um, a website, treecouncil.ie, and on that, we have a whole section about planting trees in small gardens. You can have a look at the pictures and see which ones you'd like. And similarly, somebody wants to know what they can plant in their school gardens. And again, we have material on the website. Because if we tell it to you now, what will I give my next webinar on? I know. Oh, you've had your lot now today. This is a whole new webinar, Brendan. What do you think? Yeah, I was thinking it's, it's tremendous um, that, that most of the participants are still here. You'd be glad to hear, you know, from one and three quarter hours later. Yeah, so because, look, I mean, it's, it's nearly break time for schools. I mean, yeah, we, we, we'll it's break have, time for me anyway. So listen, I think we'll they're, they're, they've, they've had enough of us now for an hour and a half. So, you know. OK, well, listen, thank you all for attending. Delighted you are sufficiently interested and especially to all the school kids who watched and the schools who participated. Thank you very much.